Hello there and welcome to another episode of 3D Christianity. My name is John Hathaway and I'm your host. And if this is your first time watching, please just make sure to subscribe if you enjoy the content here. Make sure to like and to hit the bell notification and uh, also comment your thoughts if you find anything interesting or you have a unique perspective to bring or anything like that. And for those of you who are already, already subscribed, if you'll just like this video, and we just appreciate you. And uh, today's episode is not going to be anything uh, scripted. It was just from uh, some of my Bible study this morning as I was reading through. Um, I'm trying to read through the book of Proverbs right now, and I was reading through Proverbs 9 today, and um, just some really interesting stuff that I found so I just wanted to share it with you real quick again this is not a scripted video so um, I do apologize if um, if I seem to be going in multiple directions or anything like that if this uh, my thoughts are not as organized because I don't have an outline or anything but we're just gonna be kinda going through this uh, chapter and discussing it today so I'm just gonna go ahead and first read the chapter and then we can talk about uh, different aspects of it. So Proverbs chapter 9 starting in verse 1 it says wisdom hath builded her house she hath hewn out her seven pillars she hath killed her beast she hath mingled her wine she hath also furnished her table she hath sent forth her maidens she crieth upon the highest places of the city whoso is simple let him turn in hither as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish, and live, and go in the way of understanding. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Re reprove, a, reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee, Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself, but if thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. A foolish woman is clamorous, she is simple and knoweth nothing, for she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city, to call passengers who go right in who go right on their ways, whoso is simple, let him turn in hither, and as far as and and, and as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant but he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell so what I'm noticing um, and probably for the first time um, and I've read through Proverbs several times before it's one of my favorite books in the Bible um, and I haven't done this in a long time but I used to um, go through the book of Proverbs every month like when I was uh, when I was a new Christian and when I was like in Bible college and things like that um, for several years or at least um, yeah for I'd say for you know at least five or six years I tried to read through um, the book of Proverbs every month like reading one chapter a day representing whatever I would read the chapter number of whatever that day's date was so I'm trying to do that again I haven't done that in a few years but um, uh, since it's June 9th I'm reading Proverbs chapter 9 and uh, just for I think this is the first time that I've read this that I've noticed what I noticed when reading this time and that's that's the really cool thing about the Bible is that it's so inexhaustible in truth and wisdom that uh, no matter how many times you read it um, as you go through life and you gain some life experience and 
you read the Bible and then you get some more experience and then you come back to the Bible and you read it again. What you read, you know, four or five years ago, uh, you might have got something different than what you get now. And, and now, you, um, like now, when I read this chapter, I get something brand new that I haven't seen before, that I haven't really noticed. Um, and I just wanted to talk about that today. So what I see in this chapter is there is a contrast between wisdom and folly or wisdom and foolishness. Um, and there is a, um, there's two verses that are um, basically the same. And you can see, you'll see this a lot in Proverbs. And a lot of times in the Bible, you'll see similar um you'll see similar types of passages. And I think uh, my pastor calls it like an inclusio or bracketing. It's kind of where there's a, a central thought in the passage and then um, it's bookended by some things that are um, kind of confirming it. Now, this is a little bit different, but I don't think it's exactly the same as that. But you do see the same verse appear. I think it's in verse, uh, so verse 4. And then in verse uh, 16, they are read the exact same way. And that, that verse is, uh, Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, and that word wanteth there means like lacking. Uh, so whoever is lacking understanding, um, she saith to him. So we see this um, this same verse repeated, but it's contrasted in both of these verses. So um, there's from the, the perspective of wisdom, what wisdom says, and then what foolishness says. And when it, um, the perspective that foolishness gives, it's, it says a foolish woman uh, describing that one. But, um, but I think that kind of, it fits in where it's, says that she saith to him so it's like they're both women but um but we know that if if you are familiar with proverbs there's a theme wisdom is the central theme of of the book of proverbs um in case you're in case you're not familiar with it or you just need a refresher but wisdom is the central theme and we often see wisdom portrayed as a woman or as a female um and so a lot of times, uh, like in this passage, it's uh, contrasting two different women. There's wisdom and then there's the foolish woman, or maybe you could call her folly. Um, but, uh, but they're both contrasted. And we're going to talk about the differences that, that I notice in these verses when comparing and contrasting um, the the foolish or the the wisdom and uh, the advice that wisdom offers and then whatever foolishness um, says whatever whatever foolishness brings forth so uh, let's just I'm, I'm going to go back to the beginning of that chapter looking at verse one again we're just going to kind of go verse by verse talking about this so Verse 1, where it says, Wisdom hath builded her house, and she hath hewn, her, hewn out her seven pillars. So, what I'm noticing here and in the next couple verses is that we see um, that wisdom is doing stuff. She's actively doing stuff. Uh, so, if you're, if, you're trying to, um, if you're trying to be wise, if you're tr trying to have wisdom in your life, you're trying to be a wise person, um, you should be actively seeking for it. It's not something that you're just going to, you know, the Bible says, I think it's in James, maybe James chapter one, uh, and I don't know the exact verse, and I'm just going to paraphrase it, but uh, it says that, um, let every man ask for wisdom, ask God for wisdom, or ask for wisdom from God, and he will give it liberally. Um, now, like I said, that's a paraphrase, so I'm not quoting it directly. But um, but the Bible does ask, tell us to ask for wisdom. But the thing is, we don't just ask for it. We're not. We're not. We don't just pray for wisdom and then just 
uh, expect God to, you know, zap or snap his fingers and, okay, here, you get wisdom now. Like, no, it's, um, it's a process. Wisdom is a process. It's something that you do. It's not just something that you obtain. Um, you can obtain, you can obtain wisdom, but it comes through experience and, uh, it comes through what you're, what you're doing, uh, how you're behaving, things like that. Um, and I think it's it's really interesting um, because we see here in these first two verses, I'll read them again. Wisdom hath builded her house, she hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beasts, she hath mingled her wine, and she hath, she hath also furnished her table. Um, so we see a lot of descriptions of active things that wisdom is doing. And it's not only that wisdom is being active, um, but also... Wisdom is productive. It produces something. So if you're actively seeking for wisdom, you're going to be trying to do something that's, you're going to, you need to work towards something. Um, and we're going to see the contrast of that as we go towards the end of the chapter and look at foolishness. But, um, but you have to be working towards something in order to obtain wisdom. It's not just, now I do believe that wisdom comes from God ultimately, that he, I mean, that's one of his attributes is wisdom. Um, and, and, you know, go read Proverbs 8 just to look at um, wisdom described as one of the attributes of God. It talks about wisdom being present with him at the beginning, at the foundation of the world and everything like that, before the foundation of the world even. Um, so, yeah, wisdom is one of God's attributes, and we certainly can't obtain wisdom without God. We can't get it, um, we can't get it outside of God, but we don't just get it simply by asking or just by, uh, you know, hoping for it. We have to do something. We have to be continually, um, you know, as Jesus says, asking, seeking, and knocking. Um, we have to be searching for wisdom, um, actively doing stuff to try to obtain it and doing, and you know, you're not going to get everything right all the time. That's not what I'm saying. You know, we're going to do stuff and we're going to fail. Um, and that's part of growth. You, um, you know, you're not going to, um, nobody who is, who has been who has done anything successful in this world. No one who has, you know, like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or Henry Ford or any anyone else like that, no one got to that um, status or uh, was recognized for their achievements without having some trial and error. Or like Thomas Edison, how many times did he make light bulbs that didn't work uh, before he finally got uh, before, before the light bulb finally, before it kind of like, <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Before the first successful light bulb, I mean, the ratio was probably like a thousand to one of unsuccessful trials before he reached that successful one. But, um, we, the the th the thought is what I'm trying to say is that there has to be some effort there. If there's no effort, there you're not going. There's no not going to be any reward. There's not going. You're not going to achieve wisdom without any effort being put forth. Um, so that's kind of what I'm trying to say is wisdom requires effort in order to obtain it. Besides just getting asking for it from God. Um. Now, uh, let's continue on. Let's ver read verse 3. It says, She has sent forth her maidens, and then she crieth upon the highest places of the city, and says, Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith unto him. Now, before I go into what she says, one thing I noticed there, um, which is also contrasted at the other end of this passage, at the other end of this chapter, but it says that she crieth upon the highest places of the city. And you'll notice by what she says, what wisdom is saying, um, 
um, whenever it says that, hold on, um, I lost my place, uh, so, whoso is simple, let him turn in hither, and as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled, so when she starts speaking there, when wisdom is speaking, um, it is straightforward. It is not. It's not a message that's trying to be hidden, and what she says is simple. Um, wisdom is usually a lot more simple than we like to make it out to be. A lot of times, um, we have like clever theologians and things like that that try to, or just. I mean, let's not not just say wisdom, but truth. Truth is simple. The Bible is simple. The gospel is simple. But why is it that there's so much debate and dissension over the different aspects of the gospel? Uh, I think it's because uh, people are complicating it. And I have a couple quotes here that I'm going to uh, read, but I'm going to save it until because I think it applies, it really applies towards the latter end of this chapter um, but it, it's going to it's going to relate to what we're just talking about as well but wisdom is straightforward it doesn't try to hide anything it's not disguised or trying to be represented as something else it's not um, nothing like that it's uh, what you see is what you get basically um, now she says, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine which I have mingled. So we see that wisdom has rewards. Uh, it comes with rewards. Forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. Um, and here's another interesting thing is that, so there's two things that are said here. Well, actually three, I guess. But um, in the, the first two things in this verse that we see, this is verse 6. It says, forsake the foolish. So that's the first thing you have to do, is forsake the foolish. And then it says, the second thing is live. I guess you could say the second thing is live and go in the way of understanding. So first you have to forsake the foolish. Then you have to live and go in the way of understanding. Now, a lot of times you have, um, like... For example, let's try. Let's, let's say that someone is trying to lose weight. Um, you know, they might say, "Okay, oh yeah, well, um, I'm just going to start doing all this, uh, eating all this healthy stuff and things like that, or I'm going to start working out." Um, now, the problem is, is that they are, um, they're leaving out, they're leaving out one of the steps there forsaking the foolish. Whenever you're making a transition or you're transforming, you're growing in your life, um, there's going to be ha something that you're going to have to leave behind and there's something that you're going to have to move towards. Uh, we talked a little bit about this in my videos on repentance and if you haven't seen those I would encourage you to watch them. Um, but that's basically what repentance is. is um, it's recognizing the the way that you're going that it is not the right path and going in going into the right direction it's having a change of mind um, so you can't just say okay well I'm going to start working out and I'm just gonna you know get healthy <laughs> you're gonna first have to there's gonna be some habits that you're gonna have to break first you're going to have to realize, okay, well, um, you know, those Doritos that I eat and Dr. Pepper that I drink, and I'm a big fan of both of those, by the way, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, you might have to do something about that. You might have to, um, you might have to do something about those habits and those, and it's not as easy as just, you know, so you can't sometimes just go cold turkey, just go from eating all that stuff to just giving it up altogether. Um, if you're wise, if you're practicing wisdom, maybe start weaning yourself off of that stuff. 
And this is just a practical example. I think you can apply it into spiritual examples too of like deal, how to deal with your sin and stuff like that. But, um, and how to clean up your life. You can't just expect a transformation in with a, within a day. Right now I'm, I'm doing intermittent fasting and, um, it's not some, um, I'm trying to lose like around 40 pounds and I've been doing this for just a little over a week, maybe almost two weeks. But, um, you know, I'm not going to lose 40 pounds in two weeks or in one week or anything like that. Probably not going to lose it in a month. It's, it's probably going to take, you know, three to six months. Um, I'm aiming for a 90 day goal, but, um, uh, who knows, maybe it'll take longer than that. But, you can't expect immediate results, but you do have to do something. You And you have to forsake something, and then you have to press towards something. Uh, both of those have to be there. And then a lot of people do the opposite, where they say, okay, well, I'm just going to forsake the bad. Um, and then they don't do anything. Like, you could say, okay, I'm going to stop eating all this junk food. I'm going to stop drinking soda. But then what are you doing to... Um, what are you doing to replace that with? What are you doing to, what are you moving towards with that? Are you working out? Are you walking? Are you doing some kind of physical exercise or anything like that? Um, and so, and I'm not trying to make this video about physical health, so, uh, we're not going to talk about that too much, but I think it can apply that principle of forsaking and then pressing towards something, going on to uh, towards something. Um, you can't have one without the other, or if you do one without the other, it's not going to work. We see lots of, um, there's lots of churches today that they think, okay, whenever, whenever they get a new convert, you know, Okay, well, let's find out where I can have you serve. Let's put you in a Sunday school class. Let's let's have you teach a Sunday school class. Let's help you have you help in a junior church ministry, or um, go out soul winning. And I'm not saying that that's wrong for for those people to be involved in stuff like that. I think you should. I think um, believers should try to um, to serve in any capacity that they can. But I also think that there is um, there's a process of discipleship that's missing there. Maybe there's some things that this new convert needs to, um, first they need to grow and they need to soak in, um, you know, some wisdom first before they start, before you throw them, um, uh, you know, have them preach on a Wednesday night or, uh, whatever. Um, and... I'm not trying to dog on anybody or any churches or anything like that, but I'm just saying, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes we have this model, um, we don't have it in the correct order. You try to, you know, you say, okay, well, this person is saved now. They, uh, they became a believer. So now let's just have them do everything they can for Christ. It's not, it doesn't work that way. And when you do that, when you do that, that is a recipe for burnout. I'm just saying that's a recipe for spiritual burnout. And I'm saying that as someone who has been on the receiving end of that. Um, in the year 2020, I was dealing with uh, spiritual burnout to the extent where I, um, ministry, being my wife and I were in a junior church ministry, and uh, I can't tell you how stressed out I was, how much anxiety I had. And basically, um, you know, I think, I think I wasn't equipped for it. Maybe, maybe I, maybe I was, but I think that, um, I don't know. I'm just saying, don't put the cart before the horse. Um, you need to grow, bef you need to grow yourself before you can help grow others sometimes. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, um, you know, with self-improvement and self-transformation. 
so that you can help others grow. And that's what I'm trying to do on this channel, by the way, is trying to help you grow. Um, and that's through the things that I've learned uh, through, uh, through life experience and through um, scripture and things like that. So let's go ahead and move on. Um, I'm actually, I'm just going to briefly read through the middle section here. I think there is a lot of wisdom in here, but basically, um, just to keep this video concise and to the point, um, what I was, what I really noticed when I read this chapter was kind of the contrast at the beginning and the end. But I'm going to go ahead just to make sure we're reading the full context here. We're going to read, um, starting verse 7, going through the rest of that, that middle part. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. So you're not going to get very far by uh, reproving a scorner, someone who's like an unbeliever or uh, someone who's just, um, you know, always being disagreeable and stuff like that. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. So, uh, that's just a little nugget there. Maybe try to uh, try to accept criticism. It's whenever you're criticized by someone or rebuked. Um, one thing that I try to do in my life is when someone does that, I try not to take it personally. First of all, because I think maybe. Maybe that's just what I need today. Maybe that's uh, maybe God wants that for me. Now, that doesn't mean that every time someone rebukes you, they are correct. But you should examine what they're saying as if they're trying to help you. So, anyway, like I said, I'm not going to spend too much time on this middle section, but I did think that was worth noting. Uh, give instruction to a wise man, and he will... And he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. So it's just that, that same thought here. You know, you need to be teachable. Uh, don't don't get to the point where you think you have everything figured out, because if you do that, you're going to. Um, that's basically the definition of someone that is stagnant in their faith. Someone who thinks that they've figured it figured it all out, um, and you're not going to grow if you're at that if. If you're at that point, you need to break out of that um, to be able to continue to grow and transform in your life. Uh, and then it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. If thou be wise, thou, um, thou shalt be wise for thyself. But if thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. So that verse is basically saying that uh, if you are wise, if you be wise, you will benefit from it. But if thou scornest, if you're a scorner, or if you're someone who just wants to be divisive and uh, cause problems and you don't want to listen, uh, you're going to suffer because of it. You're going to suffer the consequences. So going back to the, the verse earlier, you know, you need to be teachable. If you rebuke a scorner, you know, he's going to hate him. He's going to hate you. But if you rebuke a wise man, he will love you. So, now we're going to the contrast passage here. Remember we talked about the wise woman earlier. Now we're talking about the foolish woman. It says, a foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knowing nothing. Now, remember, this it might seem like this passage is just talking about a, fool, a literal foolish woman, but I think you need to look at it deeper. Uh, look at it as this is this is how foolishness operates or how folly operates. Um, For she sitteth at the door of her house, on a seat in the high places of the city. Now, do you notice something? I, I notice something slightly. So there there's some differences here contrasting between the wise and the foolish. First, it says the foolish woman is clamorous. What does that mean? It means that she's noisy. There, there's a lot of noise, a lot of, um, you know, just nonsense that is coming, coming out from it. Um, now, there is one of those quotes I was going to, I, I might just read both of them here, but those quotes I was going to read earlier that I mentioned. So, I saw this movie a couple months ago uh, called 
Jesus Revolution. Now, um, before you get upset about that, uh, I mean, <laughs> I know I know there are going to be people out, out there who probably think, okay, well, that's just a liberal movie. Um, but it was actually a really good movie. I was very surprised by it. I did not think it was going to be as good as it was. But, um, and uh, one of the things in that movie... Um, there was the pastor on there named Chuck Smith, and after he started, um, he started challenging some of the legalists in his church, and he started, like, letting these hippies come into his church, and, uh, they were changing things up a little bit, and a lot of legalists in the church were getting upset, the older, um, people that were stuck in their ways and stuff like that, and they were trying to basically... Uh, stamp out that light. They were trying to, um, you know, get this guy to, um, they were trying to get this pastor to basically get these hippies out of his church and, you know, let's just do things how we've done them before. Um, but Chuck Smith's wife in this movie says something very, very profound. Um, her name was Kay Smith in the movie, um, and that's, I guess, the uh, Chuck Smith's wife in real life was named Kay Smith, but, and Chuck Smith was p uh, played by Kelsey Grammer, which, interestingly enough, I've heard, and I don't know if this is 100% verified, but I've heard that Kelsey Grammer actually was born again um, as a result of... Um, taking this role in this movie, which is very interesting. I'm not saying that that role made him born again, but he came to faith in Christ um, as he was, as he took this role. But I think that's very interesting as well. But, uh, and I'm not trying to use that to to say that this, that the movie's any better to try to promote it or this quote or anything, but I, I just, that was just a side note that I wanted to insert. Um, but anyway, this quote that his wife says in the movie when she's trying to encourage Chuck Smith to press on and to not give up on, uh, you know, trying to reach these people that were um, outcasts and things like that and letting them into his church. She said, truth is quiet. It is the lies that are loud. And then I think another part of that, um, another part of that scene, she said, the truth is simple. Don't, uh, don't overcomplicate things. So here, when we see a foolish woman is clamorous, she is simple and knoweth nothing. Well, uh, what that makes me think of, it really made me think of this quote, the truth is quiet. It is the lies that are loud. So you're going to hear so much noise and so much, um, you know, a lot of times we think that the person who speaks the loudest, um, you know, maybe that they have a corner on truth or that they got things figured out. But according to this verse, I think that, I think maybe the opposite is true. So when you hear, um, you know, these preachers that are being so dogmatic and, and I'm not saying that, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with like yelling during preaching and stuff like that. That's fine. Um, it's not my preference, but I mean, that's fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it as long as you're speaking truth and speaking the truth in love. Um, but these people that are so dog dogmatic and, um, a lot of times they come across as hateful in the way that they're talking and stuff like that. Uh, what I see is a lot of noise sometimes and not always a lot of wisdom. Um, and, and that you also see this from like, um, the other side, like there's the progressive churches that they have a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, fair speeches and things that, um, that sound, you know, they tickle your ears and stuff like that, uh, that are, uh, you know, motivational and sounds, sounds very nice and pleasant and stuff like that. But um, what it, I mean, it's a bunch of fluff. All of it is really just a bunch of fluff. There's nothing really, um, of value in what is being said. So whenever you're, um,
trying to discern truth, I wouldn't just, I wouldn't try uh, for, if you're looking for a source of truth, I wouldn't rely on the sources that are being dogmatic and, um, or those that are just, you know, giving a lot of fluff. I would go, I would look for those who are interested in, um, discovering the scriptures honestly, looking at them honestly, not trying to, um, put their own spin on it or any, you know, inserting clever, um, clever arguments to try to twist the, the narrative of scripture and make it say what it's not saying. Um, but like it said, we said, we saw earlier when I was talking about the wise woman, it says, uh, she crieth upon the highest places of the city. Now we see that compared to where it says the foolish man, the foolish woman, it says she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city to call passengers who go right on their ways. And I think that that was really interesting, the wording of that, to call, to call passengers who go right on their ways. So, um, it, it could be implying that these people are on the right path, but they're simple. These are simple minded people or, um, you know, those who are lacking understanding it says, whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And, um, as for him that wanteth understanding, who lacks understanding, she says to him. So, um, you have the wise woman who is shouting, proclaim, I'm sorry, proclaiming from the housetops um, of the city this truth and then you have this the the foolish woman in this passage she's on at the corner calling people who are going on their right paths um, and maybe going in the right direction and uh, basically it, it says here stolen waters are sweet and the bread and bread eaten in secret is pleasant but he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. So what does, what does foolishness offer? What is, what, what is the message of folly or foolishness? That bread or stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. So I see a couple different things there. Uh, first I see there is no effort because uh, you see the word stolen there. Stolen waters are sweet. So uh, foolishness is saying you don't have to work for it. Um, you know, do what you can without having to work for it. And I think in a spiritual sense, um, that's true. A lot of us sometimes we, um, we're trying to find out what the, what the Bible says and stuff like that. And I'm guilty of this as well. A lot of times we look for ways out of studying, um, for studying things out, um, you know, in an observational way from the, from the scriptures instead of and, and you know exegeting the scripture instead of eisegeting our own theology into the scriptures, reading our own theology into the text, um, and that's what's that doing? That's, that's not having effort. That's, we go to, we like, we look up these different, um, maybe, maybe you look up stuff on YouTube or whatever, trying to figure out, um, how to interpret a certain passage. And then you find all these people who have these clever reasonings for trying to say, um, why the verse doesn't mean what it says. And, um, what, what is that? I mean, that's, you're not putting any effort in by doing that. You're just, um, uh, finding someone else to confirm what you want to hear the verse of scripture saying, and then you accept that. But, um, we don't, that's not the way we should operate. We should always go to scripture. And that's why I always tell you guys, I'm going to tell you again, don't just believe everything you hear. And if you're, um, if that's the one thing you need to hear on this episode, go read this passage for yourself. Don't take my word for it. 
I don't ever want you to take my word as gospel truth because I know I've said things probably even on this channel in the past that um, that could have been said better or that maybe um, maybe I wasn't as uh, wise in the past when I've said certain things and I probably sang some stuff on this video that could be said a lot better. Um, so I don't want you to hang on to any of the stuff that I'm saying as absolute truth, but go study it out for yourself. Um, I won't be offended if you uh, completely disagree with me and share that in the comments. That's totally fine because I want to be edified. I want to, and I want to be corrected if I'm interpreting something incorrectly. Um, so you see that there's no effort stolen waters are sweet and then bread eaten in secret is pleasant and then there's deception there too um you know trying to hide trying to hide from um i mean what what is there to hide from you see that in both of these passages both these parallel verses um wisdom says what does it say again come and eat of my bread and drink of the wine which i have mingled I mean, what is, um, what's better about the stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant? <laughs> you get the same thing offered through wisdom. And it's, there's no, um, there's, there's nothing that's being withheld from, from you. Uh, if, if you're trying to approach things in a wise manner, um, you know, earn things honestly, it's going to be, you're going to get um, not only the same thing, but you're going to get better. You're going to have much a higher reward, and you're going to get stuff that's much more enjoyable than trying to get, trying to obtain stuff through illicit means, through um, sinful means. So, anyway, I know that this video hasn't been, um, it hasn't been very organized or planned out not very well scripted or anything like that but I hope you're hearing what I'm trying to say um, you know try to try to be wise just re and remember um, you're not going to get wisdom it's not just going to magically appear in your lap one day uh, you can pray and pray and pray and I encourage you to pray for wisdom I would encourage you to do that. That's something I try to pray for every day. But you're not going to get it if you don't actually believe that God's going to give you that wisdom. And God's going to give you that wisdom through experience. So you have to go out and you need to be putting in some effort. Uh, go do something that is going to benefit. Whether it's, whether it's something that's going to help you benefit from something or it's going to help others benefit um, I would encourage you to do something that helps benefit others not just yourself but even if you're doing something that's helping you benefit remember we talked about sometimes you have to grow before you help others grow so uh, I'm just going to leave you with those thoughts and uh, I hope that you gained something from this video Thank you for watching. Uh, I know it's been kind of long, but I hope you have a great day, and we'll see you next time. God bless.